When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting the 18. That makes sense that these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rewind a Raw with John Pollock and Wei Ting. How are you, Wei? Doing all right. Doing all right. How are you? Uh, great. I'm tremendous. <laughs> today's yes. Sucks. Today's just been a shitty day. I'm just going to start off with that that headline. So that's uh that's where I'm at. Really? Yes. What happened? Just not a great day. Let's move on, though. It's going to be a great week, right? I'm sorry to hear that, man. Uh, it happens. Yeah. If I lie, should I just, it was great. It was a wonderful day. You know, no, not at all. It's just, it wasn't. Uh, lots I of mean, stuff I, went wrong. And um, that's, that's how, that's how it is. We have bad days and sometimes you're stuck with me on a bad day. That's completely fine. Yeah. I guess um, I, 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 is it something you care to talk about on a podcast or would you rather talk about it afterwards? Um. No, I'm sure it'll come out within the show. I'm, I'm sure people will get to get the gist of things. Okay. Um, but we have a lot to talk about. Very, very uh, busy day that was uh, happening on top of things. But before we get into the news, we wanted to discuss a little bit about what we have planned for this week. It is a brand new month at the Post Wrestling Cafe. We are off to Philadelphia this week. The first time in several years that we have been going down to WrestleMania. And Way, what are we going to be doing in Philadelphia for listeners that might not be in wrestlemania city yeah i mean usually you know if we're down there it kind of presents different opportunities for us to try different types of coverage so john and i will be going down there on thursday and rather than maybe like do full-on like recaps of events that we go to we're choosing to give um try something where we're trying to do something a bit more immediate where we'll record some immediate reactions in the form of like short form reviews and we'll send those out and then the day after is where you'll get a long form podcast from john and myself um, so on Thursday, we'll be attending the Mark Hitchcock Memorial. Uh, and then on the Friday is when we'll be giving more of a fuller review, along with any other highlights and, you know, that John and I will have time to catch up on, including Bloodsport. Beyond that, uh, we also have John Cena helping out. He'll be going to a lot of shows down there as well. And he'll also be helping out with some of these short form reviews, along with WH Park even chipping in there. So um, we're going to have you guys covered with a lot of the shows that are down there. Uh, so that'll be Thursday, Friday, um, Saturday, of course. You know, we'll be going to Supercard of Honor, so we'll do a post show for that. Um, and then we'll also catch up on whatever highlights there might be from the Hall of Fame and SmackDown. And we'll be talking about those on Saturday as well. All right, so keep everything plugged at postwrestlingcafe.com, and we will have plenty of coverage on the site throughout the week at postwrestling.com. You can jump on board. Uh, $6 gets you a month's access to the Post Wrestling Cafe. All the bonus shows we do weekly uh, for the whole month with Rewind to SmackDown, Collision Course, New Japan Reviews, MCU Later, which is in full swing with X-Men 97, plus all of your WrestleMania week coverage. You will be sick of us by the end of this week. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to all the news that was happening today. We're going to start off with this New York Post story that was released uh, containing this letter that was obtained by the New York Post from Janelle Grant to Vince McMahon dated December 24th of 2021. This is a several page love letter written by Janelle Grant to Vince McMahon on, on Christmas Eve and Ann Callis, who is the lawyer for Janelle Grant, uh, put out a statement. Um, people can read the letter on the New York Post site. Um, but Ann Callis stated, frankly, it's pretty disgusting that Vince's weeks late attempt to defend his horrendous behavior, behavior he claims to this day never happened, is to try to showcase letters that Vince himself coerced her to write. His psychological torture of her continues, as is typical of abusive predators who respond to women speaking out with increased threats. While Janelle isn't a stranger to his intimidation tactics, this is a new low even for him. And the article also gave, gave us some new information, one of which is that Vince McMahon is being represented by Jessica Taub Rosenberg of Katowitz Benson Torres, which is the law firm that just recently settled its case with WWE while representing MLW, which is interesting. And 
Rosenberg uh, gave her own response to the accusation of McMahon coercing Janelle Grant to write uh, this letter. Rosenberg stated, quote, this is revisionist history. No one coerced Ms. Grant to write that letter. She wrote it of her own accord. The fact that the letter shows it was the 24th draft speaks volumes. Nowhere in her voluminous complaint that is replete with fabrications does she mention being coerced into such behavior. The language of the letter is consistent with other communications she made to Mr. McMahon over the course of their consensual relationship. And it also added some context within the article about Grant um, through one of her representatives um, sharing information that Grant had to go through surgery on one of her fingers earlier that week. And a text exchange was shown between McMahon and Grant where this letter is brought up, where she, her concern is, how will I write your letter? I can type and read it or try to write it in a couple of days. I'm so sorry if I messed this up. I want you to have a nice letter. Um, and then there are all these excerpts from the love letter that are essentially have been lifted from articles, stories, poems, other forms of pop culture. And I mean, th there was a lot of different ways that I guess you, you can read this. Um, wait, did you have like, what were your thoughts just reading the article itself? I mean, what came to mind here? And let's also keep it that this is a, this is a strategy on behalf of Vince McMahon hmm. and his defense team. Would you say this was an effective strategy for whatever they were aiming to do? And this was clearly coming from Vince McMahon's side. Right. Um, was it effective? Um, that's really hard to say. I think if you were somebody who um, needed any shred of evidence in order to um, lean towards a, a sort of believing a Vince McMahon, um, this might have provided something like that for you. You know, look no further than the comment section of this New York Post article itself. But that that in no way, I think, is indicative of mm, what everybody feels reading something like this, um, certainly depending on what platform you go to. Many people have already made up their minds against Vince McMahon, and, and um, something like this was, isn't going to be enough to sway them the other way. Um, I don't personally think this changes, uh, in my opinion, one way or another. Um, I think coercion is a very possible scenario in all of this. Um, it's possible she genuinely meant those things at the time, but whether or not like those things are true, uh, well, I, the allegations still, I think, stand very much on their own. Um, you, even if you're in love with somebody, you could still get raped by that person. You know, uh, all of these things I think are still very possible. So I, I don't really think to me, this changes a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, I look at this and yeah, it's like certainly it checks out the fact that a number of these excerpts have been lifted from other places and you mm -hmm. can read into that whatever you want. Well, I what mean, does that, that mean? Like their defense is that because she was coerced and had to take so many, make so many drafts of this, she basically had no passion for it and therefore stole lines from, you know, what old films and the GQ article. Um, I, I don't think you can read either way on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it. It, it's there. You can certainly like it. It does like read into that. It doesn't prove anything though. The fact that this was the twenty fourth draft of mm -hmm. this letter, and the and Vince McMahon's lawyer is using that as evidence of this woman's undying love for Vince McMahon. Like I, I can tell you that of the the letters I have written to my wife, I don't think I have ever done a second draft of a letter. Do any come to mind for you, Way? I mean, in the times that when you wrote your wedding vows, how many drafts did you go through? Did you hit twenty? Um, no, I did not. I mean, I don't. I don't think I. I even counted the drafts. I mean, certainly you might type a sentence, delete a sentence, and then do it again. Um, I'm. I but like I wouldn't officially number any drafts. Nor does that mean anything, even if she did. You know, John. Like it, it, this could be a scenario where, like, hey, like. Um, what do you want for your birthday, Vince? Uh, I don't want anything. I don't know. Write me a letter. And then maybe she's taking it very seriously. And then in her own way, decided to like uh, just starting over. Maybe she could because she I'm just speculating. That's all we can do with information. Like I'm not even asking for any like hard evidence here of like anything, because this is not I don't think that this shows anything. But I think no. their idea was to show this. And this was suddenly going to bring all this support mm -hmm. for Vince McMahon. 
and to me, it's like I think it only but that's what a lawyer does. They take whatever evidence evidence there is and they exaggerate and they amplify to what I, their I side. think if if first of all, like I don't think there's too many people rushing to Vince McMahon's defense period in all of this. Oh, you'd be surprised there. reading some of the comments on again uh, of this well, that's New why Post I don't read comments. Article. but I would say for um like if you are if you have read this complaint and like this to me, paint something of like coercion now it's 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 not to me going to um uh lessen any of those uh beliefs that people had prior uh, to this um you know it's it's also worth noting in the fact that it stated in the new york post that this was taken from grant's laptop as part of an investigation on behalf of wwe's board by white shoe law firm simpson thatcher and bartlett and is expected to appear in court filings as the case progresses according to sources close to the situation and um i guess the other question you would have in this was this a solo um exercise by vince mcmahon was wwe yeah, are are they in any type of coordination with Vince McMahon in this legal defense? They are they are defendants in this case, as is John Laurinaitis. We know John Laurinaitis is being represented by Edward Brennan. We now know who Vince McMahon is being represented by. And with yeah, WWE, how interesting is all that? You know, the fact that like these people who were suing you are suddenly now the people that you're working with. Do you, what what do you think about? That. I think it's really interesting. The the law firm, like I'm not saying it necessarily creates any conflict, but it's just interesting that here is the like this Kasowitz group, like they are a main like that's why it caught so many people's attention when MLW was working with such a high profile law firm. Um, but yeah, like you are talking literally on the heels of a $20 million settlement that this law firm secured from WWE, and now they are representing Vince McMahon. And I would make an educated guess that they are not representing WWE after just procuring $20 million from them. So it would tell mm. you that Vince McMahon likely has separate defense uh, attorneys lined up apart from WWE and apart from John Laurinaitis. Sure, yes. Mm. So anyway, yeah. um, we're going to talk about this more on Wednesday's uh, Pollock and Thurston. We may be having a guest joining us on Wednesday to talk further about this, but you can tune in Wednesday at 3 Eastern. It's the same time uh, this week for myself and Brandon Thurston. But we have to get to a bunch of other stories. Sean Ross Sapp, uh, reported tonight multiple AEW cuts and this is pretty notable because one of AEW's hallmarks has been the fact that you sign a contract with us you will see it to the end unless there is an absolutely extenuating circumstance of some type of behavior or charge that has forced them to let someone go but this is not the case with these talents who were cut and those are Stu Grayson, uh, Dasha Curret, uh, Jose, the assistant, uh, George, Dasha. Um, uh, what what was her last name in AEW? What did she go by? Dasha Fuentes. Uh, I think so. Wasn't oh, that man. it? Well, her name yes. is Dasha Current. Um, yes. Jora Joel, Anthony Henry, Gravity, Parker Boudreaux, and Slim J, who have been let go, and um, it just is very um surprising, I guess, because this has been something that uh, AEW has avoided doing at all uh, the boys as well i failed to mention were also a uh, part of the cuts as well yeah uh dasha gonzalez oh was she was she dasha fuentes in, in WWE? wwe is that her name i believe yeah okay. she but I, i'm sorry it's hard to keep track i think everybody just called her dasha so okay um very surprising news um i think surprising the, the fact that it's it's happened at all because like you said john this never happens in AEW unless you have very specific circumstances with very specific people um the fact that it did happen is fascinating the fact that it happened at the time it happened during raw is fascinating the fact that it happened at the time that it happened after the cm punk interview is also very fascinating now i don't know if like any of those things have, have you know one one thing to, to do with another I but think, it's i don't think they would have anything but the timing of it all i would just say um has some effect i would say on maybe discourse surrounding tony khan and AEW of the day um and it would have probably had that effect at, at any point but especially today it kind of feels a bit more significant um any any thoughts on on the particular names themselves i mean i look at these names and i would say like the only thing that is i would say surprising is the fact that aew is actually going through with cuts i would also uh, look at you know uh -huh. they have certainly made some big 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 signings um 
But even so, like you would imagine the cumulative total here is a rather small amount. This is not like it's a mass firing where it's like 40 guys are gone. I can't say that any of these names, I mean, it seems like you you could certainly make your, your cases like for some, you know, v- very good talent that are in the mix here, but no one that I would state that you were would be shocked. Uh, I guess by. all the more reason to ask why the cuts at all versus what he's been known to do. And, that, and that's just, you know, let these contracts lapse. Well, maybe um, this is a new era for AEW. I would admit like now you've taken the bandaid off. And I mean, I always looked at that as something that AEW, it was a great, um, it, it was a great way to sell yourself for talent out there. The idea that, you know, in WWE, you can sign a contract and there's no guarantee that you're going to be, uh, see those full, uh, the full term of your contract. Whereas AEW, like that was, you sign, you are like, unless you really, really screw up, you are here for the duration of that contract. And, you know, he has been very loyal to a lot of people. Um, but uh, like, I, I think this is more interesting, just the idea of like the reasoning for this and comes at a week when he will be in front of the media. And I'm sure asked about this when he's going to be doing a press conference after Supercard of Honor on Friday. I don't know if they're doing a media call in advance, but certainly now this is something that is going to be asked about. And, you know, maybe is this a changing of philosophies that cuts are we're not going to be immune to cuts? And is this a, is this any more significant than just trimming our roster? I'll say one name that might be of interest on this one that I've seen several people talk about um, is Anthony Henry, who is currently injured due to a jaw injury. Um, and uh, is is that, uh, you know, a, a significant event, the fact that somebody was released while they were injured? I mean, he's he injured himself on an independent show. I mean, it's not like he's going to be out for months and months. He's supposed to be back. I think the timeline he had given was around he said like eight, eight weeks, eight like weeks. sometime mid March. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, he's out for two months. Um, yeah. I mean, it's um, not ideal, obviously. Um, and mm-hmm. and again, like I, I will say, um, to me, one of the significant things about all this is. The PR effect, as with any sort of like, you know, release, I, I I at least feel to me one of the reasons why Tony decided to keep like did what he did in the past and let these contracts lapse rather than release people is to prevent the PR hit it, it is to say, hey, like we're not like the WWE. We are the anti WWE where we allow our guys to finish their contracts. I mean, could we also maybe be unaware of exactly what sort of contracts these guys have? You know, well, well we certainly don't know what the t- types of contracts these guys have, but um. Yeah, um, th- there's maybe a lot to ask and, and look into with this. There's also like the, the fact that, you know, some of these people, they may have been looking at, OK, yes, there's the security of being with AEW. There's also some who like they want to be out there and working. And these are not people that are getting um, considerable um, television time. And, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say that's the case for all of them, but um, mm-hmm. that that. That also could be a factor in, in at least for some of these talents as well, that might just not be happy just being there and not being utilized. What is Tony Khan's um, media call? This I don't, they haven't made an announcement yet about a media call, but they are doing the yeah. press conference Friday night after the ROH show. Gotcha. So let's move on to CM Punk, who was on the MMA hour today with Ariel Hawani. And uh, it was the MMA hours with CM Punk because he was on for close to two hours uh, talking about pretty much everything you would want to have covered involving CM Punk. He talked mm-hmm. about Vince McMahon. I would state that of the current WWE talent, he was the most outspoken about Vince McMahon. He did yeah. not mince words. He has written this guy off like he should be gone. It's deplorable what's listed in this lawsuit. Said that he didn't even go through the entire lawsuit. The text messages were damning enough that this guy um needs to be gone and um you know, did, did not talk about um, other aspects of the lawsuit as well. I mean, WWE are listed as defendants in the case. I mean, didn't really talk much about John Laurinaitis. It was focused on Vince, but he was definitely didn't um, didn't bite his tongue on on any of it. And in fact, stated that um, some people don't want to talk about it. He's the opposite. He thinks like that. You know, there's victims out there, and this this should be uh, discussed as well. I would say like the, the three key parts of the interview, there was the aspect of Vince McMahon. There was the return to WWE last November and 
then a lion's share focused on AEW and Mm -hmm. confirming the NDA after Brawl Out. And he was very tight-lipped and could not talk about anything regarding All Out. But when it came to... Specifically the fight itself. Yeah, Yeah. he talked about the press conference. He talked about what led up to that. The fact Mm -hmm. that nothing I said there was anything Tony Khan had not heard before. Mm -hmm. And it was everything involving the brawl right down to mentioning Larry. He can't talk about any of that. Doesn't know if he'll ever be able to talk about that, but the NDA was not something he's, how did he word it? It was nothing I had to sign for something I did wrong. Something to that effect. I think it was at least a little bit, maybe um, confusing. Just, you know, we can't definitively say one way or another, um, but he, he did sign an NDA. I think the, to me, the, I read it as if he said he, he didn't make anybody sign an NDA for anything he did wrong, whatever you want to read into it. But he, he, he didn't seem in favor of the NDA. Let's just say like it, 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 it basically, he said it wasn't his idea. It was Tony's. Yeah. And there was no NDA attached to the Jack Perry story. And he pretty much gave a blow by blow account of what went down with Jack Perry. And I mean, dude, like punk was just like, he was very comfortable about going into great detail and talking about everything here. And that's, that's how the interview went. I mean, punk is a great talker and he, I mean, that's, that's CM Punk. This, this felt very much like the CM Punk that, um, famously um was on the art of wrestling podcast and spilling you know telling a, a friend at this point you know um what happened from his perspective i think he wanted to get all of this stuff out in a in a public way and he had to have known this was the interview that it was going to all come out in i guess so it's out so you can say that but he also seemed to give a real attitude of like he'd rather not talk about this you know he he's he's given oh yeah i really got that vibe from two hours here that he doesn't really want to talk about this but while we're at it let's let's pull up my coffee and pretty much give you the blow by blow i think he was more than happy to talk about it and get it out i mean you can definitely be skeptical like if you're going to be doing an interview with somebody like ara hawani you you know you're going to be asked these questions so i i have to imagine he was mentally preparing himself for for answering for a lot of this but he also seemed to try to give the vibe that um the wrestling industry has given away too much behind the scenes and it's come to hurt the wrestling industry overall. Um, has it, I can tell you it's, um, it's made several people a lot more interested. I mean, look, you know, survivor series is, 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 it, it, at 1997 resulted in, I think, um, uh, the attitude era for, and, and the Mr. McMahon character. So in many ways, how's the health of the industry? It's wonderful. How's the health of um interest in CM Punk? I mean, it's wonderful. So I mean, he did say that. He said like he 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 can make money off of a lot of a lot of this stuff. He and I guess like seemed to give the impression that he'd rather not completely spell it out for everybody. It is sort of like the 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 how I I read it. Um, but anyway, what what was what were we on at this point? Well, let's let's kind of go in order and cover the sure. AEW stuff at, at first and um. So, I mean, going backwards, he goes into further detail about the Hangman Page promo. And from Punk's side was that they sat down, they went over the promo, the workers' rights promo, we will call it. And again, Punk stating when they got out there, Hangman had a completely different promo. He didn't go through any of the stuff that they had discussed in the back and blindsided him. Blindsided him that felt he was double crossed on television. Mm -hmm. And again, punk stated like, basically, who is this guy to jeopardize this, this house that we, this million dollar gate that we have that they had coming up at double or nothing and spoke with him in the back about, he was not going to say Colt Cabana's name in this, but I think everyone could put Mm -hmm. two and two together that they sat down and he understood you standing up for a friend but doing it on public on on national television is totally unjustifiable and mm-hmm. couldn't trust this guy now it was not brought up um punk using television time himself to then call out hangman page and challenge him to i guess a legit fight on television and hangman looking like a fool because he was mm-hmm. not going to be answering this shoot challenge that punk was uh laying out on on television so that to me was the point where things had gone off the rails at that point. And I thought that was sort in of the CM where... Punk AEW run. You mean 
I think so. I think mm-hmm. at that point, okay, you are now like, and listen, if you want to criticize Hangman Page, fair game. If you want to criticize CM Punk for his retaliation, I think fair game. It never should have gotten past that point because we are now using television for retribution and we are yeah. using it for our selfish reasons and we're not doing any business on television. Mm-hmm. And Punk reiterated the fact of how much, how valuable television time is and we're using it to play our own political games with one another. But things progress, things continue, and then we have the all the stuff that happens with the scrum, the fallout from that, and Punk's belief was that he thought he was done after All Out. And you could see that he was, um, you know, he, he just reiterated the fact that it was nothing that Tony Khan had not heard before from him. And, I mean, this was as definitive as Punk has been regarding his criticism of Tony Khan stating that uh, b- both dismissive of AEW, which he certainly was in the press conference. I think everyone took that as one of the main takeaways was that this was a guy that did not see AEW's successes up to that point as providing it any kind of validation that they were this upstart that, you know, he did not see these guys as having achieved anything basically was one of the sentiments you got from that press conference. And I would only double down on that conclusion listening to his thoughts with with Ariel here of the fact that he was critical of AEW as a business that, I mean, kind of just leaning into the stereotype of AEW as this billionaire son's playground to put on fantasy matches and not nothing about making money or selling tickets. Uh, Specifically, he called out um, maybe catering to an audience that prefers just you know so one one of the i don't want to misquote him you know everybody listened to the interview it's 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 a very important interview and, and, it, and it was tremendously conducted by ariel hawani um but you know he he said something to the effect of like he has a different metric for like how he decides what um i don't know what good wrestling product is or what a healthy uh, wrestling something to that effect and he said um if your idea of a good wrestling promotion or a healthy or a successful business is um, the number of five star matches you put out, and not you know um, the amount of money you make or the amount of people that you draw through through the gate. Then they're in the wrong business, and and that was kind of his assessment of what AEW was, at least in part. You know, a company that perhaps focuses on um, something like you know five star matches rather than making money. Or, yeah. or drawing attendance or drawing ratings. And I'm not even trying to play devil's advocate with him, but I would also argue like Punk's mentality is very much rooted in those he came up watching and the industry he came up learning, which was cutting promos to sell tickets and to draw people to the arena or in later years to spend $30 on a pay-per-view. That's not the business either today. Like that yeah. is oh. a... That is a industry that has passed us by. This mm-hmm. is about producing television content and producing as much television content as we can get paid for. And that is the game. That is the reason the industry is making record revenue. And it's ultimately going to be Tony Khan's failure or success once this next television negotiation goes down. We mm-hmm can't give a passing or failing grade until that deal is completed. And if they get the increase that they want and they're into profitability, then all of these arguments that people have made against Tony Khan's style of booking, or he can't produce wrestling at this level, all that goes out the window. But what we do have are meaningful metrics of where AEW is now. And this is by far the strongest competitor that WWE has had since 1999 and the fact is that i mean this is a company that what they did at wembley stadium what they have been able to do i mean this is to me not a company that is just you know existing with several thousand internet fans that are tuning in i think like there is a evolutionary process too when it comes to the talent that are in that locker room and ones that see different as bad as opposed to different being what the alternative is attempting to do. And it's, and I think punk was on board at some point of this being that alternative, but I think you really got the sense that he, 
he saw this company as something that was not in line with what he believed the business is. I don't think he ever fully defined like what exactly it is about AEW that um, gives him the impression that it's not a what did he say a real business or or something to that effect like he said something like you know basically like i think what he, he said was, these guys don't want me here this isn't a real business yeah. this isn't a business predicated on making money drawing money selling tickets doing business it's not what it was sold to me as okay so thank you for the quote and i i mean so does that suggest to you it, i mean it goes beyond you know this is a company that's focused on five star matches like it seems like a lot of what he was trying to say was that this is some sort sort of boys club amongst you know the people that were like the elite essentially like is what i think he was trying to get at without exactly specific specifying those words. at one point he was asked point blank who doesn't <laughs> want you there the elite and he said yes right right um does that mean i'm sure if you ask the elite they would have their reasons related to business why they felt cm punk was detrimental to be in their locker room this can go on for a long time and i'm grateful that we got this from cm punk because it's the most clear um document we have of how he feels about this entire thing will we ever get the other side i don't know i i i really don't know um i mean uh, it, it will depend on on who is like allowed to speak about incidents i mean from our knowledge like there's nothing that prevents jack perry uh, from speaking and he comes off very poorly on from punk side in mm -hmm. terms of uh, like that aspect of things. Something I didn't realize was I thought the glass incident was referring to him punching the glass with like his bare hands, but they, they um, punk here said it was, he wanted to smash it with a rod of some sort, like a pipe. Yeah. Um, the story was that they were going to do an angle with a rental car and use glass. And Tony Schiavone came to CM Punk stating Jack Perry is cussing me out. He's also cussing out Mike Mansouri and several others. And they were asking Punk for his assistance here that they don't want Jack Perry doing this stunt. And Punk came over and stated that not on my show. You can go to Wednesday and do that. And he said that when he approached Jack Perry, Jack Perry was cool about this and didn't raise his voice or... Um, there was no like arguing over this. And then this, I guess, was the was the receipt on the all in pre-show with the real glass line, which I, I thought, listen, it's you could argue that CM Punk was probably at the end of his patience level by the time that the Jack Perry incident happens. That mm -hmm. said, I don't defend Jack. Perry. I, like, I thought that was like a completely ludicrous thing for him to again utilizing television time not for the job at hand but rather settling your own personal issues on television where we are not going in this direction a fraction of your audience has any clue what you're even talking about um and mm. it ultimately it ended up being the absolute worst case scenario because yeah um straw that broke the camel's back that was so it to speak i mean at the time, I remember thinking, okay, like he's just taking advantage of some online buzz to to make some reference because he's playing a heel, assuming that he had cleared the line beforehand with CM Punk. Totally N different. Knowing how tense <laughs> that situation is, I t completely agree he's the last person you want to target. But I, I'll, I'll also say like it really feels to me like knowing now kind of what we know about Jack Perry – he, this guy seemed like he was really on edge, you know, over a, a period of time for, for whatever reason. And and how do we know what he's kind of been going through, you know, when he was told uh, about, you know, not being able to use glass or, or whatever, you know? Well, um, Jack Perry got to the back and he explained that he uh, punk went up to him and this is when they had words and Jack Perry basically said, do something about it. And Punk did. He said, I never struck him. I choked him a little bit. Right. I just choked somebody a little bit. And he, I guess, put him in a choke. Samoa Joe told him to stop. So he did. And then he told Tony Khan he quits. He said, I turned to Tony and said, this place is a fucking joke. You're a clown. I quit. Uh, he opted to go out, do the match with Samoa Joe because he wanted to do it. Um, he was advertised on the show. He did it for the agent, Jerry Lynn. He did it for the ref, Paul Turner. And it, he knew it was going to be his last match he would ever have with Samoa Joe. And 
completed his match, came to the back and said he was never kicked out of the building. Uh, but security did say that they would be making their night easier if he just left. So Punk opted to leave and bought Nando's for several members of, of the roster and said um, uh, the other uh, part here was that after Jack Perry made the line, Punk went to Tony Khan at the building and told him to handle it regarding what Perry said on air. And if not, um, then he won't like the way he handles it. And that's when he approached Jack Perry. Now, mind you here, Tony Khan is producing the biggest show of his life. So I don't know what Punk was expecting Tony Khan to do in the moment of this pre-show match and to um, handle this. I can certainly state that there were there were missteps by Tony Khan along the way. Um, this entire the, again, thing, not just not just all in, but this the entire thing. Yeah. And I hope that he takes solace in the fact of where leadership failed in the, in this and mm -hmm. how these combustible elements all got to a fever pitch. They hopefully never should have. Mm -hmm. And listen, this is a difficult situation where you're dealing a lot of big personalities and egos. And Tony Khan was trying to keep everyone under one roof and it became untenable. Um, it, so he was trying to keep them there without necessarily doing the work and manage. It, it sounds like at least from Punk's perspective, without doing the work in making sure that the the chemistry between all the participants um, was there so that they could even coexist. From Punk's perspective, after all in, um, sorry, all out the press conference, um, he says nobody contacted him from the company. He didn't have any communication even with Tony for several months. He he stated that um, he. He stated that after the all out press conference in 2022, yeah, that he he didn't hear from anyone for six months. He mentioned he had to pay for his surgery, um, which sounds nuts. If that's did accurate. he say he had to pay for it or that he had to like do his own research? He said or... he had to pay for the surgery. Now, unless oh. that was like a just his words were jumbled. I, I can't fathom that one, um, sure. but that he had to book his his physical therapy and um which is in stark contrast to his current um, uh, injury where he says the WWE has been basically handling and kind of guiding him through the entire process. And he suggests, he says he feels he might be what if the recovery time might be like half that uh, of what it was the last time. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I mean, and he kind of had the same feeling that I think most people had of the idea of putting him on a separate show and the elite on another show and, Never would they mix. Just figured this is not going to work. It mm -hmm. did not work. Um, they yeah. didn't get into you know specifics like you know the situation involving Christopher Daniels, you know your talent relations rep that could not attend Collision. Um, it was just like that was the ultimate band aid of trying yeah. to keep all these parties happy, and it's remarkable that they got like two months out of this. And continues to be remarkable to me the fact that like even proceeding with something like that idea, much less something like all in where everybody had to share the same space with each other, um, that they didn't have everybody sit together in a group just to kind of at least talk all this stuff out. Now, from what we know, Punk has been open to the idea, but the other side is not. Um, now, if Tony Khan wanted all these people to sit down and talk together, I feel like he could have had that happen. So ultimately, is it a Tony Khan thing? that you have to place blame on. I I think the buck stops with Tony Khan. Like that is ultimately the person that is making these decisions and the wins mm -hmm. go to Tony Khan, the losses go to Tony Khan. I think yeah. in a in a talent relations situation such as this one, um mm -hmm. you know, I I can understand like both sides here. I can understand Punk stating let's just sit down. This doesn't have to be as big a deal as it's been made out to be, but it is a big deal. And from the elite side of the, just like, we're not working with the, with this guy after he just uh, goes through with that press conference and just totally dismisses like that was, it was more than just like a shot at Colt Cabana, a shot at hangman page. It really was the entire company that he just ran down. And I honestly, like I watched that press conference and just thought like, this guy is just not somebody that is, he just does not see the merits of this company. That's what it felt like in that, in that setting. 
this to me now like really feels like the words of somebody who was already cheated you know like what maybe to me the context of the hangman workers rights promo and the fact that punk felt like he was double cross going onto tv knowing how short of a few cm punk can have and how much of a fucking grudge he can hold against anybody who wrongs him the all-out press conference makes a bit more sense to me. Not justifying it. It's completely the wrong way to go about handling your differences with a colleague. Um, but I can at least understand that that sort of like fury, you know, a little bit more just from what I know of him. He said he felt the elite didn't want him there from the beginning. Um, shut down any possibility of ever um, bearing the hatchet with Colt Cabana. Stated that prior to the all-out scrum, Cabana had come up to him at an independent show stating, can we go talk? And Punk said, I will never speak to you unless a lawyer is present. So that is about as concrete of a status update as you're going to get. And, and then the, the, the WWE stuff, which was covered at the beginning, it, so he has let go the first week of September and they talked oh, about, that. had a lot talking, uh, spoke a lot about the, the visit he had while he was still under AW. That's right. That's well. right. So this was in April of last year mm -hmm. when he went to the raw in Chicago and it confirmed may. maybe may. I think it was April. Oh, I'm okay. Cause they said may, but you're okay. They did I trust you. May I trust interview. you more than I'm pretty sure it was in his own memory last yeah. year. Uh, when he went to the raw in Chicago, he stated that he was asked to leave the building um, did not buy Nando's on this request to leave the building um, and said it was a Vince McMahon call. He didn't know Vince McMahon was physically there at the building or working remotely, but it was a Vince McMahon call for him to leave. The, the building. circumstances that led him even backstage in the first place was because he was doing the CFC uh, commentary and happened to be on the same flight back as several WWE stars talked about almost kind of making friends with like Liv Morgan on the flight and through Liv Morgan, um, Bailey texted him, you know, because Liv Morgan uh, was telling Bailey, I feel like this is such a, <laughs> why am I even watching the interview? Anyway, so he was, he's saying he was going to attend as a guest of Bailey's just to visit a friend. Yes. And his argument was AEW talent have appeared on WWE programming uh, in the past. What's the big deal about me meeting with friends? Uh, referring to what, Burt Baker? No, I, I think he was. I think he was bringing up, you know, when they had Chris Jericho do Austin's podcast or when they, they allowed some of the guys to do the John Cena appreciation night. I mean, that was all stuff with the company. Um, okay. And he said that AEW people at AEW were very upset and the word betrayed uh, was used uh, to him. So already you're just getting the sense that this attempt to bring him in house on collision. You remember when they were going to have the upfronts um, and they mm -hmm. never announced Punk with Collision, and that was almost a, a delayed announcement uh, before he was on the first show in Chicago. And and then uh, things fall apart where he's let go. He said he he has he did not talk to Tony Khan again after the Wembley Stadium show. There was no contact that week. He was fired and thought that it would. He doesn't believe that he did anything to put Tony Khan's life in jeopardy, but he can't get into his head and. What was his exact comment about Tony Khan? He says, um, he's not a boss. He's a nice guy. And ultimately, I think that's a detriment to the company. That was his summary of Tony Khan. Mm, right. And and then really, it's Nick Khan who is positioned as the the guy that is the most in contact with, with Punk. Um, Punk was with CAA when Khan was there. And sounds like they even had some kind of handshake agreement before he went to AEW that he didn't get into details about why that never materialized, but even before it does, backstage, it right. does tell you like punks. And I mean, this was not a secret at the time that, you know, punk was definitely more open to going back to WWE going back years and not something that just materialized in the last mm. six months in terms of his, uh, that hurdle to clear, to come back to WWE, but he gets, uh, he's in some contact. And then it's on the Monday before survivor series that Nick Khan calls him and they're talking that week. He gets on a FaceTime with Paul Levesque on the Thursday, which is Thanksgiving in the U.S. And they apparently it's water under the bridge about all their past issues hmm. and shows up at the arena on Saturday, signs his contract and walks out. And that is the return. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting saga. Uh, I think uh, also interesting that um, he had no non-compete 
you know, which Nick, Nick Khan wishes he realized before uh, that phone call with CM Punk. Because... That's right, because the call was about coming back at the Rumble, mm -hmm. and then Punk noted the fact that, you know, you guys have he could have come back the Chicago. next. He could have come back the next day after his termination, it sounds like. He could have been there instantly. Like, Chicago was the show to do mm -hmm. it at, uh, it, mm -hmm. at Survivor Series. I mean, they handled it really, really well. But yeah, there was no... No compete. He was free to go um, immediately. Um, so there, there you go. I there's sort of, certainly many, many different um, takeaways you can have from it. I think the most of all is that I believe he was being, um, you know, th this is his side of things. I'm certain that there will be um, other perspectives, other counter uh, perspectives that may come out of this. I don't know if we'll ever hear. Like a hangman page may as well have like sewn his lips when it comes to CM Punk because this guy has not broached any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Perry maybe um, will have a time that that he will give his end of things, but um, you certainly got a, a, a large insight into CM Punk. Yeah, you did. And now you have some of this information and uh, go wild internet, you know, make up your own minds and, and debate amongst yourselves, I suppose, you know, just when you thought this story died, I mean, this just completely reinvigorates things. And I think, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of philosophy we've seen at least through um, the Bucks and Page and the Elite is to not directly speak about it. Um, there's speculation that like stories could be fed through sources. We don't know. Punk was also very critical of the of the wrestling media on this uh, particular call uh, uh, interview as well. Um, but I, I I just I don't really know if if anybody's minds are going to be made one way or another. Um, I'll say like this is the most clear information we have from a certain side. So I think it's very easy to see this as the definitive truth but it's it's also something we should keep in mind this is one side of the story I'd and um, certainly take that into account yeah yeah so will we ever know you know the the sort of uh, factual information of it all i mean i i hope so but maybe not for uh, not 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 this week at least Let's just quickly go through another uh, couple of quick news items as we're uh, we're running late here um the CMLL card on Friday was an excellent show. Um, sold out crowd at Arena Mexico with Blue Panther, Mystico, Volador Jr., and Ultimo Guerrero defeating the BCC and Matt Seidel after Captain Matt Seidel submitted to La Mystica. And then afterward, Danielson issuing a challenge to Blue Panther for this Friday's Arena Mexico card. So you can add another match to this coming weekend. And I think it speaks volumes about AEW's relationship uh, with outside promotions that you could certainly argue that Brian Danielson wrestling this Friday night on Supercard of Honor would probably be the biggest thing on that entire card. And instead, he's going to be not just um, not available, but he's going to be wrestling on another streaming service that requires your audience to spend $35 if they want to watch. I'm not saying it's going to be a huge number that you are taking away. But I'm also not expecting like a huge number is watching this super card of honor show either. And I would uh, honestly, like I, I think a lot of people that um, th there's a lot of options on, on Friday night and it's going to be interesting to see super card of honor and where it slides in. Like it's looks like a good show on paper, but I don't know if it's one that um, it, it, it's competing with a lot on Friday. <laughs> We don't know if Danielson was ever, you know, uh, um, even considered for for something like this, um, or, or Supercard of Honor. I mean, um, but we also know that this is a bucket list item of sorts for Brian Danielson in his wrestling career, and um, I guess we also have uh, an, an, uh, a, a suggestion out there that Tony Khan is a really nice guy. So um, maybe maybe not that surprising that you know they he should would just allow air this match live from Arena Mexico on the pay per view feed. <laughs> sure why not i mean that would get me to you know bonus value for it but uh incredible atmosphere uh that for, for that cmll show what was it Sixteen thousand people in attendance for that match? whatever the uh, attendance is there yeah i mean it was like the, the whole card was just I, I thought it was a terrific show to watch there was some really great um wrestling between that card um the yuma anzai win over katsuhiko nakajima i love that match on on saturday from all japan and then i thought collision had a pretty strong um, not like a giant attendance in London, but a pretty vocal uh, crowd as well. They got 
super like from the start with Matt Cardona and it carried through throughout the show. So um, those are some of the weekend notes. SmackDown did 2,201,000 viewers and a 0. 0.6 in the demo, both numbers down 2% from last week, while Rampage did 349,000 viewers and a 0. 0.11 back in their normal time slot after last week's live show after Dynamite. Both shows were going against three separate college basketball games, which had about an average of 10.7 million viewers watching against uh, each respective show. So the fact that um, Rampage was up from two weeks ago in the same slot by 7% and SmackDown was only down 2%. Um, yes, it was the lowest SmackDown audience of the year, but they were against a lot. And as was tonight's uh, Raw as well. I don't know if you uh, might be... Uh, so interested in this way, but I was uh, watching raw and the women's basketball game combined. That tells you like this, wow. this uh, Iowa LSU game was a big deal. I was watching both tonight. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was, uh, this uh, might be one of the biggest women's college basketball games in it'll be among the most watch ever. Huh. And um, yeah, so that was going against raw and then they had another game following it. So it was very heavy sports competition tonight uh, for raw. But let us now move on to Raw from the Barclays Center. Sold out. WrestleTix announcing 13,345. WWE announced 15,546. And the largest domestic gate in the history of Raw. So this would, I, I would assume that it's uh, some of those O2 Arena Raws that probably have the uh, record. But this would be the largest in the U.S. Is that a bigger discrepancy than usual between re what WrestleTix has and, and what WWE announces? Um, we're kind of at that. Yeah. About a 2000, 2200 difference here. So okay. So normal. Seems like we're getting a, a comfortable uh, distance. We'll see what they announce for mm. WrestleMania. That's going to be the litmus test. Okay. Cause it's mm. going to be around like the right now, both shows are around 60, 61,000, um, each night. And we'll see what the, the announced attendance is on, mm. on Saturday and Sunday. They recapped the closing angle from last week and announced that Cody Rhodes is not medically cleared to be here tonight. So I guess someone got fired by the end of the night. Um, I, there are a lot of ways to enter a wrestling arena, John. Don't you know? Well, Whether or not you're cleared. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how that works. The Rock starts the show, and this is a first hour without commercials. And mm -hmm. I thought they're gonna run. They're gonna give us a Broadway Rock segment. I An thought hour long. Rock I thought segment? the when when he called on Reigns like at 18 minutes, it was like. Are they going to go the whole hour here? I bet you there was a, a a thought in mind that, well, as long as this guy goes, we're just going to ride it. Um, and this was a pretty, this was about 30 plus minutes in total. Not as long as I was thinking it was going to be. But Rock comes out and he cuts a promo. This was very, uh, man, he is, uh, he is borrowing from a lot with this incarnation and it's all working tremendously. He brags about splitting open Cody's head, rubbing the blood on the belt. The only thing missing now on the belt is Mama Rhodes' tears. And then he says, you know, there were some people that were not happy about what I did last week. And he shows some TikTok videos of these little children crying, seeing Cody whipped and bloodied last week. And Rock comes back, says, that breaks his heart. I've got three girls myself, but I have a message for those kids. Sometimes a man has to do what a man's got to do. And sometimes people talk shit when they shouldn't be talking shit. And the crowd was just in love with this guy. They were, I mean, if this guy were sticking around every week, mm -hmm. I mean, he'd be the most over baby face in probably, he might already be the most. He over already baby is. I, I mean, okay, well, Cody is that right now, but you're right. Like the moment he decides to turn, um, that's trouble for, well, they have two different shows now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if The Rock will be back on Raw uh, after WrestleMania. I certainly don't expect him to be back on on the SmackDown um, in any sort of regular basis. But it, it, this this was also just like an entrance where I I was just trying to remind myself, wow, I've really enjoyed this run. Like he's been fantastic. he's been excellent. He's been tremendous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's he brags about ratings skyrocketing the gate tonight, and then Reigns comes out and. There's chance of yeet. He says, no yeet. This is going to be the easiest WrestleMania of Reigns' life. He's going to smash them on Saturday. Then it's bloodline rules on Sunday. He thanks Rock. And that Cody is not fit for this role. He's lucky to be here. 
and we made this cool in 2020. I'm like, there was nothing cool about WWE in 2020. Well, nothing. he's saying he's saying that's when I guess his his, his run began. as tribal chief began. Yes. Yeah. He says, while Cody back in 2020 was off somewhere doing a whole lot of nothing. This is their mountain. They run this business. And they are interrupted by Seth Rollins. He comes through the crowd and isn't going to run into the ring and get ambushed like Cody did last week. But he calls this the biggest Raw of all time. And that they need the biggest main event of all time on Raw. So he proposes Seth Rollins versus The Rock on Raw. Which I think half the crowd was just <laughs> laughing. They're like, not a, not a goddamn chance are we getting that. Then he said, well, then I want to face Reigns tonight. You guys pick who I can face. You can even name the stipulation. And then he added the big caveat, if you've got the balls. But they're not falling for it. Rock says Rollins doesn't want any of this. Neither of them are fighting tonight. Instead, Solo Sokoa steps forward. This poor guy in this whole crowd, they realize instantly what they're getting. And they booed poor Solo here, who says he will fight Rollins in a bloodline rules match. And um, <laughs> they really heavily teased this and then delivered a... What was interesting about this was, like last week, they did not tell you that um, either of these guys were coming back. In fact, with Reigns, they actually wrote him out leaving, uh, but Rock, they didn't. And I'm curious if this week there is the the memory of last week that there's the chance that Rock might come back. And if you did stick around, you you were rewarded for sticking around for the closing angle. I thought they were a lot more suggestive that The Rock would be back. Number one, because it's bl a Bloodline Rules match, which, I mean, you know, for all we know, is essentially a Rock gets to interfere match, you know, that that's supposed to headline WrestleMania. Um, two, you wouldn't have Roman say, I'm leaving, and then The Rock not saying I'm leaving, and then think The Rock is not going to come back, right? Um, th the segment was, uh, I thought this was their attempt at, trying to give Roman a little bit more here, you know, in a segment with the rock. Um, I think you can also say, um, it's, it's hard to look like a superstar when you're in a hoodie next to a guy it. who's got like a slaughtered cow as his vest. Yes. The something tells me like the rock could like wear a hoodie and still feel like the rock. Anyway, Roman had even a little bit of a flub, you know, at the very tail of, of his line. He said something to the effect of like, it ain't ever, ever going to be crystal. And then just kind of flubbed on the word crystal. But thankfully, it, it came it was not very clear what he said. <laughs> it was not. And thankfully, it came very close to where Rollins was supposed to interrupt anyway. This is all to say, I don't remember the last time Ro Roman ever really kind of flubbed a line. And I just continue to feel like him sharing a stage with The Rock is not only maybe affecting sort of the audience's aura of how they view Roman. I think it's it's got to have a clear effect on Roman's own confidence. You know, when you're standing next to Dwayne, trying to having to follow the types of promos that The Rock's going to cut. Look at um, this. Way is putting Roman on the couch right now. Tell us more. Well, I mean, I'm just saying this is this is sort of my inference and maybe material they can use to tell a future story. But I just continue to feel like um, Roman's promos in contrast to Dwayne's continue to feel so much more scripted and forgettable. I think like the the Goodfellas sort of inspiration feels like that much more of a, of a crutch rather than something that was novel before. And the hoodie and, and, and sort of sweatpants look just kind of feels so, so low rent compared to The Rock. So I, I even though this was very much like their attempt, in my opinion, of having Roman regain some of that lost spotlight by having him talk a bit more. Um, I just thought it continued to highlight that gulf between them. So it, it's going to take the, the feud between these two for me to see them at, at equal footing, because the most that I've seen that in this feud was when you had Roman ask the rock to acknowledge him and they never really kind of fanned those flames that much more. So they could really just be saving it for the match itself. Well, also at the end of the show, we will go over the lineups for both nights of WrestleMania because they have confirmed which matches are on which night. Then they shot. So we got, like the two hour CM Punk interview on the MMA hour. And then the next guest was Rhea Ripley on the show. And wouldn't you know it, Becky Lynch was just circling downtown New York around their studio, just waiting for this punk interview to end. And then Rhea Ripley starts her interview and Becky Lynch storms the studio. Yeah. What was New York, New York Rick to, to stop this from happening? 
I don't know this um this just descended into a uh, chaos here in the MMA <laughs> hour studios and then they were they had a big pull apart at the MMA hour which is being shown on the, on the go home edition of raw and uh and, and that was and that was that I did not get to see this interview with Rhea Ripley, so I, I did not know what was uh, how deep into the interview they were when they shot this. At least from what I saw coming off the Puck interview, it, it, it felt very much like an in-character interview, which you know mm. could, could, can be fun at times. But the, the whole thing was you know done to to stage an angle, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, adding a little bit of hype um, around it through a, a, a brawl in a popular podcast. Kathy Kelly interviews Becky, who is here to finish what she started, and she will be in the ring tonight to fight Rhea. Judgment Day against New Day and DIY. Uh, we saw Xavier Woods using a jackhammer on JD, and then Dom tried for the 619. Ciampa stomped, uh, stopped it, and then Gargano super kicked him and delivered this suicide dive to the floor right into the desk. Um, Head first. Oh, Johnny yeah. Gargano was, um, this was a very, uh, very scary looking dive from him. And then the South of Heaven is hit onto Kofi, followed by the Razor's Edge to Ciampa. And Damian Priest pins Ciampa. Five minutes they go. And this was the idea that going into WrestleMania, Judgment Day, they've had their issues, their communication problems. But they get the win here, although we would get more um, dissension, I guess, uh, in the back. Mm -hmm. And no uh, no R-Truth, or a Miz, for that matter, on this show for any uh, closing segments with the Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Fast paced match, you know, to, to give a bit of spotlight to this. Gary, uh, you had five minutes for these guys. Oh, is that right? Was that how? Oh, fast yeah, this it was, was five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they just wanted to, you know, promote the tag team ladder match. I don't really have much to say about the match itself other than, uh, you know, do we look at, into anything about the booking here? You know, you had Judgment Day retain. This could very well be, I would say it's actually maybe even likely that this would be their last time. Like, do you think they leave the championship or with the championship from WrestleMania? The tag titles? Yeah. No, I think they lose. I don't think so either. So this could have been their last tag team title defense. Do you look into any, anything? Um... Well, this was an eight man, so not a title defense. Oh, you're right. Never mind. Well, maybe their first, the, their last one is tag team champions. Do you look into anything uh, uh, with um, DIY taking the pin or uh, Chompa taking the pin? Um, no, I don't. I, I don't think it's like telegraphing that they're winning, for instance. So I only might because I I think they're the best candidates to to win the titles. Um, I guess it could be our truth, but then I, where I do you go really from there? But where do you go from there? Like that's that's a comedy act, you know, at best. Maybe they want a comedy run with these tag belts. Oh, I I anyway, well, yeah, maybe. Reigns has to leave the arena because he is off to write the speech for Paul Heyman. So Roman Reigns is inducting Heyman on Friday night. They also announced uh, through The Rock's Instagram confirming Leah Maivia will be going in and Dwayne Johnson will be inducting her. So that's our full class for the Hall of Fame this year. Chad Gable is training with Sami Zayn. So this video, this was almost everything we said last week that you could get some great stuff out of this right down to the Rocky Apollo and the, the freeze frame at the end of this. Yes, yes. I just part of me wishes like we got like three weeks of these instead. Yeah. It was like a day for Sami Zayn to run into the obstacle, overcome the obstacle. And by the end of this grueling day of training, he's ready for Gunther. I just wish we got a little more of this because I think these two have this odd chemistry together. And I think the longer you play it out, the more impactful it would be to either have a, an alliance between these two or better yet, the turn that you would expect from Chad Gable beyond just an afternoon of working out together as their <laughs> foundation of their bond. I, I don't disagree. You know, I, I imagine they do, they would have made their minds about this match some time ago. I mean, I know at one point Brock Lesnar was rumored to face Gunther, but I mean, those plans would have went away quite a, quite a bit ago. So um, would this have benefited more from having more time um, sort of simmering and doing vignettes like this? Maybe by a couple weeks, but you know, they, I feel like they've done a great job, you know, telling the story in as many weeks. And I think by the time we get to the match itself at WrestleMania, this crowd's go going to be fully invested in the story and they're going to be red hot for, like they've successfully conveyed what they needed to convey by this point. So this, they're going through the drills and Zane finally 
says that training is done. You're trying to dr- run me into the ground one week before Mania. And Gable accuses him of losing the hunger he had last year going into WrestleMania. And Zayn screams, I am afraid. I'm afraid of letting people down. And they have got like, the sappiest of music underneath this like th- this was not being done like i think they were doing this for some level of dramatic effect but i think they also wanted to lean into kind of the the, mm-hmm. the cheesiness of this I mean, but this not was, overly cheesy like this was not, not over this not was not the freeze frame at the end the freeze frame they just dove right into yeah yeah they did ro- but rock. this was not camp like they could have gone very no. much completely rocky rocky three short shorts you know on the beach Rocky Four, like I don't know, like training in the mountains to like you know survive. I bet you they pitched the beach idea and they said no, no, <laughs> we'll we'll lock arms in the ring, but we are not going into the we're not going into the beach. It's fun because it's Philly. You know, you have this scenario where you have your own Ivan Drago that, that that's this incredibly dominant champion. I so badly wanted that line from Gunther at the end of that beatdown. If he if he does, he does. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> they can't hit those notes too hard because then it becomes a parody and it becomes it's just just a joke. And this has not been a joke. This has been a very serious storyline with some excellent, excellent performances out of both Chad Gable, but to me, especially Sami Zayn, who like people will make fun of, like maybe people like me who like will um, uh, sort of like celebrate good acting in professional wrestling by by calling somebody good a- uh, good acting, and then you'll see all these people say, "Oh, you should go watch a movie. You think this is good acting? Fuck you. This is good <laughs> acting. Like this is good acting in any scenario. Sami Zayn is fantastic." I felt I feel in this role, and I mean, it's a role really written for him, isn't it? Was this cinema? This was cinema, yes. So, um, I love the freeze frame at the end, and you know, he he, he battles this choke from from Gable. We, he Gunther has to go for a rear naked choke, and Zane just reverses and and counters out of it. I mean, that mm-hmm. that's an easy one there. Um, they they could make a great video package for this, just out of that press conference after elimination chamber where Zane was so legitimately down at that presser. Um, yeah. And just, and they leaned into that here, like the shot of his wife watching him lose at elimination chamber, comparing it to when they showed Gable's daughter crying. Um, so anyway, there, yeah. not only is this like, I think a great chance to do the title change, but I think you could have some good stuff coming out of this as well. And I'm more intrigued now knowing that that raw is in Montreal a few weeks later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think th- I'm still more on board for I don't know what I'm more on board for cuz like I I don't necessarily feel like Sami needs to win the championship in order for this storyline to continue. He could be unsuccessful either through intervention from Chad Gable realizing he sh- he should be the one to beat Gunther, not Sami at that moment or um or just he could just lose and they can continue to tell the story. But um Sami winning and then having Gable chase Sami for it I, uh, would be a wonderful, you know, side story as well. Or is or is Gable dead now? Is this is this the you know? Are we doing Rocky Four? Gable's dead. Gable's Gable's daughter will have to, you know, um, uh, have the a new series. title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Judgment Day is in the back, and Legato enters, and Judgment Day did not get the memo that they were showing up on Raw, and Rhea says how they have to communicate better, and we get this awkward interaction with them as they started to play darts. Sami Zayn and Bronson Reed, a rematch, and Zayn connects with a tope con hero, but then gets caught with a high cross by Reed into a power slam. We see Gable watching in the back. Zayn manages a sunset bomb, and then Reed comes back with a Death Valley driver. And then finally, after avoiding the tsunami, Zayn sets up for the haluva kick when Gunther drags out the lifeless Chad Gable at the entrance and Zane runs to check on his newfound friend. When Gunther attacks Zane chops him. This, if you go back, the third chop he hits on Sammy Zane was the sound of like a phone book being thrown off a, like a three story apartment. Okay. That's how loud this sounded. And he tells Zane to stop dreaming and stands on top of Zane holding up the belt. And Zane finally gets to his feet, battles up and he's nailed with the belt shot. I think Zayn's got to win this title on on the weekend, but uh, a great angle to end this. I mean, Gunther is he, this guy is just great in this great. role. Yes, yes, he he's been fantastic just as a device of this be, being this unstoppable champion. It's just it's the perfect type of um, obstacle for somebody like Zayn to overcome. Um, does Zayn Zayn have to win? I mean, 
I'm not sure. I, I do find it fascinating how like they did this rematch with Bronson Reed, and I thought, oh, okay, they're going to you know give Sami Zayn the win back um to show that he's regained his confidence. They did not have that happen, so it tells me that they might just be keeping Reed, you know, ha- with that win over Sami, so that he could challenge Sami for the championship afterwards. So that that might give some indication if if you're to think that um there there's a reason that they kept that. Um, so we'll see. Jey Uso is wandering backstage, probably wondering what was I booked to do on this show? And what he was booked to do on this show was to run into Lil Wayne, who's just hanging in the back. It's like, hey, you want to come to WrestleMania? It's like, yeah, sure. You know what? I'm going to debut my brand new single. The worldwide premiere will be coming up this, this weekend. Mm-hmm. So we Decided. got Lil Wayne and Meek Mill at WrestleMania. So they announced that Meek Mill will be voicing the opening video. I don't necessarily know if that means he'll like be there. I I, I actually don't get any indication that he's doing like the a performance or anything. But is Little Wayne going to not collaborating for uh for Beast Mode? Uh, who? That's that's their their collaborative effort. Little Wayne. Little Wayne and <laughs> oh okay, thank you. I don't they've think al- so. they've also uh done collaborations with Rick Ross and uh DJ Khaled. So thank you. Maybe we could get them all together. Um, maybe I don't know. If they but... if they grabbed Rick Ross, that would be oh, the ultimate token from, balance of power token from AEW. Yeah, that would be the biggest signing. Interesting. I'll say like it feels like the celebrity sort of um uh I don't know involvement in this year's WrestleMania is way cooler than it was in uh many years past. Well, ACDC have not been confirmed yet. You don't like Jey Uso will run to. Yeah, you don't think Jey Uso will run to. Um, you know, ACDC is backstage at on SmackDown. I'll say the 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 UFC celebrity game is getting pretty. Um, I mean, it's uh, who do they have? I mean, it's pretty much your your favorite politicians. Okay. Yes. Or not so favorite. I guess I just wonder if, like, you know, we can think about um any CAA um sort of like the fact that even somebody like um you know an, an Ario Manual or or a CA are kind of involved in WWE now does that give them access or to Endeavor yeah or so I'm sorry Endeavor yeah. does that give them any sort of I'm, access I would definitely imagine that they're going to have probably like unannounced like just you know crowd shots you know of like various people there like we would see yeah. like with, with the NXT cameos in the crowd but with celebrities for WrestleMania yeah. I could very well see that hmm. and and we can keep keep our eye to see how long those celebrities stay in those seats. Sure. Yeah. Uh, they confirmed Leah Maya via into the hall of fame. Then Ivy Nile and Maxine against Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. This went three thirty-seven. Um, This audience was at a silence for this match. Nile was tagged in the pit bull as Cole reminded us. And Maxine drop kicks Indy into Candice LeRae on the apron and then rolls her up for the pin. And Candice LeRae is furious at her partner for not cheating and following her guidance. And, Indy appeared to be having an epiphany as she realized, you know what? I'm not booked at WrestleMania, so let's let's change things up a little bit. Yes, th- that should really be her wake-up call. Although yeah. the winners aren't booked on WrestleMania either, so I don't know if you can make uh, solid evidence of that mm-hmm. either. But True. Yeah, well, there's always next year. Um, there's there's definitely clear story progression here with Indy and, um, you know, um, Candice. But it, it, they're definitely still battling against the sort of per- perception of irrelevance within this women's tag team division. It's also taking a long time to get these story beats, you know, to, for us to get to where we, we are. So I just sense, I mean, not, this really kind of had no chance, you know, especially on a show with The Rock. But um, the crowd just overall at this point is not that invested. I think she needs to insult more, um, you know, people's siblings, uh, deceased uh, family members. Well, they've kind of dropped that. I mean, they're not even bringing that up. It's just like Candace is really awful. That's as far as they'll go now, but they won't get specific. Rock and Reigns are on Jimmy Fallon Wednesday night. Jay Uso runs into Seth Rollins. He says, I've got your back tonight for Bloodline Rules because um, I have nothing else to do on this go-home show. Oh, then we had this awesome vignette. Drew McIntyre is at a funeral parlor, and he's going to give a eulogy to CM Punk and Seth Rollins. And his first words are, Look in my eyes. What do you see? And he calls CM Punk an out of shape has been. Your body has failed you worse than it did in the UFC. And then moves on to Seth Rollins, his actual WrestleMania opponent, who he calls a thin skinned Seth cringe lord 
who saw Jared Leto's Joker and made a career out of it. He deserves to have the casket door shut on his title reign and will put him down once and for all. Amen. So, I mean, I guess I thought in my mind, oh, okay, like I, I always assumed Seth was going for uh, Heath Ledger. It's way more insulting to call him a Jared Leto <laughs> copy. It's not insulting to copy. compare you to Heath Ledger. You got to go with Jared Leto. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, this was terrific. You know, great, great to see WWE spend some of that production money, just kind of getting out, shooting these things with these guys. It's it's something NXT has done so well throughout the years, and I'm finally glad to see the main roster do so much more of this. I'm glad this was inserted into the show because beyond this, I mean, Drew was like non-existent on this show. Beyond mm -hmm. like, he had a Jey Uso role backstage. Ricochet and Ivar. I thought this match was awesome. They went 10 minutes. I mean, Ivar is maybe like the most um, unheralded guy on this roster. Or Ricochet. Well, I think everyone knows Ricochet is a super talent. I don't think Ivar quite gets the uh, the, the acclaim. Um, but nonetheless, both men on the road to the Andre the Giant Battle Royal on Friday night. Um, there was a seated senton out of the corner by Ivar. Ricochet fights back. It's his own uh, Sasuke special to the floor. And then a springboard clothesline is delivered onto Ivar and hits a handspring elbow. Ivar's back with a tiger driver for a two count. And then Ivar does his own reverse crossbody, misses the doom salt. And then as he goes for the avalanche in the corner, Ricochet grabs him and deadlifts him up for a suplex, which looked very impressive, followed by the 630 and pins him in 10 minutes and eight seconds. Very impressive. Very, very good match. You know, I, I feel like I almost say it every week for these, like what are essentially filler matches without any real stakes attached here. It's just like, here's a great Ricochet match. Ricochet and Ivar, Ivar for that matter, I think they almost always overachieve their booking. He, he, Ricochet is not in any like real significant, significant storyline other than like some attachment to, to, to the judgment day, but he always manages to get these crowds into these matches um, just through the, the spectacle of, of, I think his abilities. And I would say the same very, very much goes for Ivar. So on a show where you want to maybe just kind of like save your WrestleMania talents into like talking segments. I thought this was definitely like the right, the right type of match to make for a show like this. We go back to Judgment Day with Legato and Priest is frustrated that Ricochet has not been handled yet. JD says, I'll take care of him in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. And Dom says, well, in case JD doesn't get it done, uh, he basically concludes that JD is going to fail. So he hires Andrade to go take care of Ricochet and then he'll make him a full member of the crew. And Andrade is like, cool, sure. And Andrade yes. is also in the Battle Royal. He is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, notably here, they had Legato, of course, hanging out in the background, and they had um, Dom introduce Santos to Andrade, and Andrade said, I remember you. Um, and, and these two, I believe, were even in the same faction in, in Mexico. Uh, told Angel he remembers him, too. He teamed with uh, Angel pretty recent, or not that far off in the WWE. So they are seemingly drawing some sort of attachment between Andrade and Legato, at this point, and obviously, of course, um, Andrade and the rest of uh, Judgment Day as well. Becky is in the ring and calls out Rhea Ripley. Adam Pierce is freaking out. We can't jeopardize this match. So Rhea fights through security, brawls with Becky in the ring, and then they continued backstage. And Adam Pierce, I thought, was going to have an aneurysm here. He was just losing his mind as they uh, separated him. Damage control, they respond to Jade Cargill. Naomi and Bianca Belair on SmackDown. They are the most dominant faction and they are the future. They will also be making an announcement on Tuesday for the location of Clash at the Castle, which will happen Saturday, June 15th in Europe at a stadium. Mm -hmm. does, does a castle need to be present to, to, for, for a, a city to host? Um, as long as um, they don't dub this as like the anniversary of some sort of the first clash at the castle i'll, I'll be happy mm. they didn't do, they didn't do one last year i don't think yeah don't they, think did they did the, they did the the, the, one, the lone one with reigns and drew and that was yeah. the year prior and yeah they didn't do one last year uh but that's that's the june pay-per-view so um again another international um event because you've got france in may you've got saudi arabia in may and then this will be the june show which is only three weeks before the Toronto show with money in the bank. Hmm. 
And then they go back to the U.S. for Cleveland with SummerSlam. And I think that's as far as their wow. calendar. Has so been. between WrestleMania and SummerSlam, they're going to yeah, be. Yeah, there will be no U.S. PLEs until uh, SummerSlam. Interesting. Dakota Kai and the Kabuki Warriors against Shayna Baszler, Zoe Stark, and Tegan Knox. This was Asuka's first match back since March 11th, so mm-hmm. she is all good to go. Uh, Stark, Baszler, Knox connect with triple German suplexes and running knee strikes. And Stark hits a big high uh, springboard high cross to the floor. We go through the break. Knox is in with a senton on Kai. Kira Fuda is applied to Asuka, but then Kyrie grabs her leg from the floor, turns around into a head kick from Asuka. And then after Stark hits this incredible springboard missile drop kick that sent Kyrie Sane into Philadelphia, um, Knox then drills Kai with a running uppercut, misses the senton, and after a running boot is hit with the insane elbow as they pin Knox in 857. Crowd cold for this one too, un- unfortunately. I, I I mean, it was probably missing some star power from the, you know, significant portions of the feud, or at least like more popular portions of the, of the feud in Bailey or Bianca or certainly Jade, um, which you'll probably, you'll definitely get on Friday, I should say. Um, more of an indication of like, maybe where damage control is at, in my opinion, you know, they, they haven't really been all that threatening um, as an act, even though they all hold the championships. And we had our walk and talk with Kathy Kelly and Seth Rollins, who is going to put the pedal to the metal tonight. And he always has a plan B as he goes out for his match. And before walking out, he walks past Drew McIntyre and he tells Drew, I ain't dead yet. And he continues walking through Gorilla and into the arena. I do like them experimenting a lot with these different like techniques and different ideas. I think they're mm-hmm. good. I think there's a fine line though, between just like, we just get crazy with them and we're just going to be like doing stuff for the sake of doing different stuff. Like there's a, I, I like, I like change, but I think there's a, there's a balance and maybe that's uh too, too, too much of a, I think they're reason. they're still in the experimental phase and probably receiving a lot of great feedback on um the experiment or at least like just the idea that they're even experimenting. I feel like we're still very much in the post Kevin Dunn sort of like you know honeymoon phase where we're like hey we could do this now we could try this we could try this well let's try something different every week and maybe at some point they will get kind of I think this audience is so hungry for change and yeah. different ideas but let's like I just feel we're going to get to the point where it's like Oh man, like Seth Rollins walked to the ring with a can- with a fucking GoPro on his forehead. That was so cool. It's like there's a line where it's 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 just a little bit too much at times. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. But we'll see. Seth Rollins and Solo Sokoa bloodline rules. So Rollins goes after him before the bell even rings. They're brawling on the floor. Rollins gets rammed into the steps and they set up a table in the ring, which Sokoa puts him through with a Samoan drop to set up the commercial break. Another table is placed in the ring, and Rollins fights to deliver a sunset bomb and follows with the stomp when Jimmy Uso runs down and lands a super kick. Jay Uso is out, and him and Jimmy fight to the back, but then Jay flies out from the backstage area and in walks The Rock. And this place, there were, they were so amped to see The Rock again. And he enters the ring with Rollins. And Rollins had this like nasty like welt on his cheek from the uh, that uh, I, this guy is not going to be uh, in great um, great cosmetic shape tomorrow. I feel between his face and his back after these uh, this whipping he's, he took. He's got these big sunglasses to cover him. Well, Rollins starts smiling when Cody Rhodes music plays. Medical team be damned and outruns Cody and we get Cody and the Rock going at it in the ring. Cody goes to deliver a rock bottom on top of the desk when Roman Reigns pops out from underneath the ring where he must have had a flashlight. He was was working on his induction speech and yanks out Cody and they just go to town on these two. They beat the hell out of Cody and Seth Rollins. Cody, uh, Rock takes off his weightlifting belt and he whips the hell out of these two just over and over and over again. They tear off Cody's shirt. There was a huge CM Punk chant, but within five seconds, they were like, not a chance. He's not coming. There was no punk on the show in any and said he was going to be at the building. But I guess they they got the punk. juice out of punk last week and they'll wait for this weekend for not not to mention um, today. Yeah, I guess I guess they got their uh, everyone got their punk fill from yeah. earlier. Pardon the pun. And then uh, Rollins is taken out with a Superman punch, spear to Cody, 
and they just continue to whip them as they lift up the championship and the weightlifting belt. Rock has just anointed himself now. The his weightlifting belt is his new prized possession. Yeah, yeah, it's really come in handy. And I mean, I know it's Cody's gimmick, but now I I kind of just see Hollywood Hulk Hogan. You know, when I see it, and and we are kind of in the Hollywood Hulk Hogan phase of the Rock's career, are we not? You know, kind of like the superstar Graham, yeah. Hollywood Hogan. Like uh, I'm sure Rock is uh, taking from many influences. I, I just mean, he, he, he's certainly just as big, you know, and and I mean, there there's been at least some speculation from what we've seen so far about how well he might not actually be moving. I mean, having a belt and walking slow, I think, works perfectly fine when you're supposed to be, you know, major heel. And it's the, the whipping has been used to a tremendous effect. Yeah, there is a chance that Mama Rhodes might be one of the biggest baby faces this weekend. Oh, I guarantee you'll you, you'll you'll get a chance. You know, like she has been, been like if they just show her if they cut to her on camera like the place is gonna go nuts for her like yes. she has been like the 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 backbone of every promo in the lead up to this that she's got to be incorporated in some way on that first night so, so you think it'll be the first night but she's supposed to be there for the second night so that cody can hand the belt to her will she be there for both nights or do you save it for night two well, I think you want her there for the match with The Rock, don't you? But uh, The Rock, if the I guess, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, win. Can, you can have her there for night two. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, really good closing angle. Um, I think good start to the show with with Dwayne Johnson, and I think Roman giving a better than usual sort of outing with with uh with Dwayne. Um, and throughout the show, you know, this was very much I think the type of go home show where you weren't going to get much significant storytelling or activity because everything at this point has been told. You didn't even get in ring action with a lot of your top guys, you know, Seth excluded. So um, there were a lot of filler matches in there, um, but some great video packages in the form of Drew McIntyre's as well as uh, Sami Zayn and Gun um, G Chad Gables. I really like too. Yeah, I. I wouldn't say anything approached the closing angle of last week, which I thought mm -hmm. was terrific, but every like the big stuff is all clicking in a big way. Um, you had a great crowd in Brooklyn, minus some of the reactions of the, the lower end matches. But um, overall, for a go home show, like this feels like a pretty strong WrestleMania that is coming up, and yet all the big stars on the show and and I, I think really emphasizing like the bloodline rules match being this this match that Cody cannot win and setting that up for night two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they did announce the match lineups for both nights. So night one will be headlined by the Rock and Reigns against Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. The LWO against Santos Escobar and Dirty Dom. Bianca Belair, Jade Cargill and Naomi against Damage Control. Jay and Jimmy Uso. The six-pack tag team ladder match with the Judgment Day defending against DIY, The Awesome Truth, New Day, A-Town Down, and New Catch Republic. Gunther against Sami Zayn and Rhea Ripley against Becky Lynch for the women's title. And you have heard Becky Lynch, uh, number one, indicate she was expecting to be on night one and has been publicly pushing to be on first. So... We'll I wonder if this is the match order that they've um they were announcing on the on the in the order of the show. It's possible. Like this, you, you look at this lineup and you could definitely see this being the um the, the order that they go in. On mm -hmm. night number two, well, let's just do this for the sake of this exercise, uh, in order from uh in ascending order with uh Seth Rollins versus Drew McIntyre for the world heavyweight championship, Eel Sky against Bailey for the women's championship. L.A. Knight against A.J. Styles. Mm -hmm. Will they leave in police vehicles? See, I'm surprised this one didn't get the the street fight um, stipulation just because, I don't know, they've, they've been brawling on each other's lawns and across the oceans and all this stuff. Well, uh, we have Logan Paul, Randy Orton, and Kevin Owens. The Pride. Bobby <laughs> Lashley and the Street Profits. The Pride? Are they, are they the oh. name of the Pride? What? So this was reported to be their name. And then whether it was Lashley or one of them, they actually did use this on their social media, but I don't think they've ever been called this on television. The pride. Okay. Um, well, I guess this has been, uh, uh, I'm seeing an article here from wrestling headlines from January, where it says this is a while ago. Bobby Lashley confirms report of his new group being called the pride. Okay. Yes. Well, okay. maybe Lenny Hart can introduce them. Yeah. 
um, taking on the final testament of AOP and Karrion Cross, and then Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. So as of now, seven matches, night one, six matches on night number two. I don't know if we can expect this to change. I mean, nor, nor really, like, that's a healthy amount of wrestling, especially with some of these matches getting a lot of time, right? Trust you me, know? WWE can take a four-match show and get three and a half hours out of it. I have no issue. I have no concern about them stretching six matches into four-plus yeah. hours. Um, this is more than enough. What do you think about the balance of matches? Do you, do you think, do you have a preference for a particular night? Um, no, I think that, um, I think night one at the moment looks just slightly better. You know, you've got, um, well, oh, if, if that, like Rhea and Becky and Gunther and Sami Zayn, I think those two matches are going to be stellar. Um, Jay and Jimmy Uso, I think that they're going to have, um, you know, the ladder match. Yeah. I would, I would say night one probably is the stronger top to bottom lineup i would say of the ones i'm most interested in but night two like seth and drew um should be outstanding like it's bookended by some really really strong stuff and i mean the in-between stuff i mean there's nothing that it jumps out at you as like wow this is like even your philadelphia street fight i mean that's one that you know the, the story has certainly not grabbed me but i think that they will probably have a lot of Bells and Dom, attached to that one. Dom and Ray will get tremendous reactions, and you know Dragon Lee's going to do something crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a good balance of like you know um, uh, anticipation plus like good you know story driven matches. But man, I think the Cody versus Roman for maybe as much as we've lamented like Roman's role in this entire thing. By the time we get to that match, this place will go nuts because we've all been waiting for it for what a year and a half. You know, Cody versus Roman and, and Cody finally handing the belt to Mama Rhodes. Um, it, especially if The Rock is going to be involved ringside, it's it's going to be electric. Well, let's go. If you have any super chats, you can submit them. And we're going to go to forum.postwrestling.com. We got one super chat here from Bluey who sends 100, I believe this is rupees or shekels. Apologies. But thank you very much for 100 of them. He says this it, IC title stuff has, has, has been so good. I love the character stuff. The Sammy Gable dynamic and the unpredictability. It ends. Great pre-tape and angle today. Yeah. I hope Bluey, um, you know, has enough left to maybe take a bingo to Hammer Barn. Uh, I've, I've not uh, experienced the Bluey... Uh, hysteria yet buckle up hmm. let's go to cody from maine bizarre day for wrestling when to me at least a go home raw before wrestlemania is overshadowed by events outside of the ring there was no surprise in hawani using his show to run an angle for wwe given his fandom but to me this punk interview came out of nowhere the punk interview came out of nowhere i don't know um However, as a fan of both Punk and AEW, I don't really feel any differently than I did yesterday. He needed to go, but at the same time, it's sad that it panned out the way it did. Both sides have legitimate gripes. Both sides can look very poor depending on the specifics. Uh, then there's the first real batch of cuts for AEW that I can remember. I'm sure it's been mentioned, but Tony Khan previously spoke about honoring contracts outside of someone being problematic. So to see this happen is very surprising. Anthony Henry being included is particularly surprising due to his current injury and the fact that his tag partner, J.D. Drake, was retained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kind of went through all, all that earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's fascinating. I think maybe Cody was saying like maybe he didn't know that Punk was announced for the MMA hour and, and maybe it came as a surprise that he was on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they promoted it pretty heavily from I think they announced it last Wednesday. Let's go to Jeremy in Texas, who says the ultimate edition of Raw before WrestleMania, not to be confused with the ultimate thrill ride. Hard to believe that was seven years ago. Yes, it was. Wow. Seeing The Rock every week leading up to WrestleMania has been a treat. Who knows if he could still go in the ring, but his character work has been a privilege to watch on this run. My hope is this title match with Roman and Cody does not turn into an overbooked mess. Hope you guys have multiple cheese sticks on the menu this week. Enjoy Philly. So tonight, um, the rock did not appear from the beginning of the match. You know, bloodline rules just basically means no holds barred and like you can use weapons uh, and you should expect members of the bloodline later on. Um, yeah, let's hope it's not an, an overbooked mess. 
Muggen writes, Raw got to the end of the finish line. The ending segment with Cody and Seth getting hit with a weightlifting belt was quite uncomfortable. The opening segment didn't veer into mindless self-indulgence, and going commercial-free for the first hour did help keep it on track. The Drew vignette was excellent, and the Sammy Gable Rocky-style montage was well done. It's nice to see the cracks beginning to form with Judgment Day, continuing with Dom's courting of Andrade and Legato. I'm pretty sure night two of WrestleMania will take years off my life. Wheezy F baby, and the F is for finish the story. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Thank you very much, Muggin. Let's go to Yeti, who says, or Alex Francois, who says, Al uh, even guys, another solid chapter of Raw on the road to WrestleMania. Some storylines could be a little better, as Dom definitely feels like he's do being shoehorned into the card. But in his defense, due to the reactions he's had this year, he deserves to be there. Oh, I, I think... <laughs> I think Dragon Lee and um, uh, who, who's Santos are probably very grateful that um, Dom and Ray are, are attached because that match will be that much re received that much better, I think, because of those two. Uh, just as a quick follow up to my call on Friday, the secondary market for tickets tonight was insanely high. I headed to a bar near the Barclays Center, assuming tickets would drop below $100 at some point. But as The Rock was making his way to the ring, the cheapest ticket behind the WrestleMania sign was still over $200 and was trending as the hottest event in New York over opening day for the Yankees and Mets for the week. Thanks, as always, Alex Francois in Brooklyn. Okay. Jay from Colorado. Raw was and has been pretty great lately, but that is mostly due to The Rock and the Bloodline against Cody's storyline, bookending the show on each end. The stuff in the middle is digestible and enjoyable, but is overshadowed by the beginning and ending of the show. It's not working towards Raw's detriment right now, but I'm worried that they may not be able to keep up post-WrestleMania, assuming the Bloodline and The Rock go away. Time will tell, and I'm interested to see how this new regime begins the scenes handling the post-WrestleMania season. Yeah, well, I wouldn't expect The Rock to be around too much, but I mean, I mean, for WrestleMania, you want it to feel different from all the other shows, right? Um, let's say Cody gets the belt. Um, what do they transition to that could stand a chance of capitalizing on some of the the, the buzz off of this? You know, um, is you there had, you had Drew beat him? You've got Seth in the mix. You've got, I mean, if you take Punk at his word that he, you know, could slash his recovery in half from the first one, like that. That's then before summer that you could have punk back in in the mix of things. Um, Consider be looking at Gunther getting away from the IC title. Mm -hmm. um, they have that history with, with Cody from the Rumble last year. I think they're like in a great state of things when you when you talk about um, you know having opponents ready for Cody. And there's the obvious of the rematch with Roman Reigns that can be held off for several months. That can be a really big deal of Roman going Rubber match challenger and then of course you've got the rock match like i i don't think you have to be too concerned about um ideas for cody as champion and the, the and there's probably like one or two that we're not even thinking that could like sneak through and and, and you know like a randy match could you do a cody randy match yes. absolutely so, could you do a logan paul cody match yes yeah these are all options on the table Let's go to Ani, who says, Ever since the Raw where Cody and McIntyre faced off, this has returned to being the show I enjoy the most. Over the last six to seven months, WWE has become the promo company with guys like Cody, Rock, Punk, Sammy, Drew, Kevin Owens, Reigns, Gunther, etc. really stepping up. We've had some really solid promos in the build to Rania, but I didn't think there were as many as the past few weeks today. Pro wrestling is all about making you care who wins and who loses, not putting on five-star matches. And nobody is doing this better than The Rock in 2024. Watching that ending, did you guys think that Cody winning is uh, is winning the tag and losing on night two? How confident are you that he gets the job done? Um, I'm pretty confident he finishes the story. 68.6% .6 sure. Oh, okay. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say 100 Last one, it's from Nas from New York. Just got back from the Barclays Center. Amazing start, amazing finish. The place was packed. The line to get in, the merchandise line was crazy long. A lot of people got to their seat late. Really great go-home angle. Seriously considering making a terrible financial decision to get to Philadelphia for the weekend. Mm. Well, there you hey, have man, it. YOLO. Yeah, but you do hopefully live a long life and you want to have security as well yeah pro proper funds yeah well do the responsible thing Nas. well wrestlemania is coming up this weekend so we will be off to philadelphia later on this week but before then uh we are going to have 
Uh, coming out on Tuesday, we have Up Next with uh, Braden Harrington and Davey Portman. We've also got Rewinded Dynamite and Pollock and Thurston coming your way on Wednesday. And then we are off to Philadelphia. And you can log, log on to postwrestlingcafe.com and follow all of our travels, all of the shows that we will be attending. Uh, we'll be doing some, some short, quick reaction videos and then extended shows on the days that we are down there as well. And live Saturday and Sunday night right after WrestleMania for everyone here on the YouTube channel. So hit subscribe, turn on the notifications, and uh, you can be locked in for WrestleMania week. Hey, there are a lot of things I think we could plug on this particular week. It's a very busy week for us. One of the most important all week. Uh, but, you know, um, you'll hear about them in, in some of the ads uh, below. I do want to give a shout out to The Brady and Spiffy J for their new track, Finish the Story. Okay. This is a song Braden worked on with, I believe this is Be Detroit's Cousin, uh, where they uh, sampled Downstate and they turned it into this magnificent song rap song about cody um do you think they'd mind if i played it to close the show if they cease and desist us uh, i'll be very let down okay well i hope not but um give me a second here while i set this up but i mean i i think um they'd appreciate a little bit of a pub here and i think our audience would too because this is a very good track did you did you did you know um all the music that you hear uh, or at least in our closing theme in the chop tees commercial for their 20 percent off uh, uh special during wrestlemania week all done by the one and the only Braden Harrington. Oh, I, th I thought our pal Ben was uh, providing all those tracks. Uh, well, um, I think Ben knows Braden pretty well. Anyway, this is uh, to close us off here. Finish the story by uh, the, the Braden Harrington and Spiffy J. <laughs> Bigger than Lil Wayne's drop later this week. The crowd is here. They just say, no way I can blow it now. I've been here before at the top of the mountain. Remember how that went down. All of the pressure is set on my shoulders. Hand me the weight, but I'm smart in this mode. The thinking about us, even more I get older. This isn't a story, I'm not a place holder. This is what it's like being born for this. I've been torn for this. A metamorphosis got me feeling like the myself. Put it on me, I won't mumble for the end. I admit that y'all did that. I made myself elite something y'all can't repeat. I took on the challenge. I won't taste no beat beats. I slayed the beast that they let out the cage. Killed the artist, built blood on his page. I'm fighting my hardest to remember regardless. I beat my brother just to get to the stage. With every step that I took, they had this time to finish my story. From a blind hair to the elbow, I'm living up to the glory. My own pen and my own pad, and it's time to finish my story.